Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of the Menas Masterclass series where each month I will interview one of my favorite cricket personalities for our elite level Patreon subscribers. This episode I am joined by former Australian captain Lisa Stalaker. Lisa was a champion all-rounder playing 187 times for Australia across three formats and she became the first female to take 100 wickets and score 1,000 runs in 50 over cricket. Lisa retired from the Australian team on top in 2013 after winning her fourth World Cup in her father's birthplace of Mumbai. Since then she has become a much-loved commentator and broadcaster across the world. Lisa holds a special place in my heart as she was the first international cricketer to come on the podcast back in 2016 and has always been generous with her time and has given me great support. Let's get into my interview with Lisa Stalaker. Joining me all the way from Chennai is Lisa Stalaker, former Australian captain. Lisa, how are you? I'm good, thanks, man. It's nice to see a friendly face. Absolutely, but it, it's it's amazing to have you... Um, on this show because you've been on Cricket Unfiltered and the Australian Cricket Podcast quite a few times, but we've never really done a sort of, I don't know, deep dive into your career. And you're someone in the cricket community I really admire because of the way you conducted yourself as a player and, and a post and your post playing career. So it's just great to be able to sort of talk to you about your career. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. Obviously when you first came on the podcast, it was just after you retired a couple of years and and now you've sort of been retired for a while. How's it going in the media? Yeah, it's it's going well. I mean, I think last year everyone, regardless of of what work or or what your um, passion was, life changed dramatically for everyone. And it was about six months I was at home, and my family were like, "Geez, this is the most we've mm-hmm. seen you. Off you go, <laughs> get back on the road again." So um, I guess I'm very fortunate now. Um, the fact that cricket is being able to be played and even though we're all in bio bubbles um the game is being able to be played and obviously IPL is great but I had a great summer as well with Channel 7. And uh how many bubbles and how many quarantines have you done? Uh well I've done I've done probably two bio bubbles so um, I don't know being stuck in Melbourne during Christmas in that period because of the state border closures counts as a bio bubble, but um, that kind of obviously affected my time back at home. I wasn't able to be in Sydney where, where I live, but uh, I've done only two weeks hard quarantine when I've come back from the last IPL. Um, I, I literally have left home, I think around the 28th of January, and I haven't come home yet simply because I don't really want to do the two weeks quarantine. So get all the work done and dusted, and then I'll come back home um, for the Olympics and then obviously the Australian summer. So um, it's been hard because this has probably been the longest time I've been away and the world is still really crazy here in India. Things aren't good um, outside the bio bubble. A lot of my friends are getting COVID. A lot of their family members are getting COVID. So it's scary times. But yeah, I'm fortunate enough to get to call uh, the best uh, T20 domestic competition in the world. And I'm glad you're not doing multiple quarantines. Just put it off and do it, do it in one hit and binge all your TV series and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the good thing is when I do quarantine here in India, it's I think it's six days. We've got nice rooms. You can order food whenever you get choices of Western and Indian food. So um, it's a little bit different when you go home and do um, government hotel quarantine. So Definitely. I can cope with this one. <laughs> Good. Now, the reason I got you on is, is because it's been a huge couple of years for you. I mean, you've actually had some serious recognition for your contribution to the game. And firstly, last year, you were inducted into the ICC Hall of Fame, as you know, the 27th Australian, only joining people like Bradman, Border, Tendulkar, Gavaskar, Warren. You know, that's pretty good company. So you just tick off the ICC Hall of Fame. Then earlier this year, you were inducted into the Australian Cricket Hall of Fame in the same class as Johnny Muller and Merv Hughes. Unfortunately, we didn't get the usual sort of Hall of Fame um, dinner or the, the, the award dinner where you get to sort of make a speech, but just a phenomenal recognition for your immense contribution both when you were playing and post-playing. Tell me, I guess, 
Well, well, who lets you know about these things? Do you know, um, I mean, did the ICC just send you a, an email? Hey, we're putting you in the Hall of Fame. What, what's it like when you get that bit of news? Uh, yeah, I got an, um, first I got a call from someone who was actually on the nomination committee saying, Lisa, you've been nominated um, and it's unanimous. You'll be in the ICC Hall of Fame. And I said, it's a joke, right? It's a stitch up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not that young. I mean, I'm not that old, should I say. Uh, there are so many more worthy recipients in my eyes. And then I think a week later, I got an email from the CEO letting me know that the the ICC um, Hall of Fame was coming my way. And you're right, the, the last couple of years has been difficult because normally with the ICC Hall of Fame, you get to fly over business class with someone to the awards and I think it was going to be in South Africa and I was going to take my father and it was going to be a nice little trip for us, but um, unfortunately not to be. And, and, and then to, with Cricket Australia, um, I was um, informed by Alistair, the CEO of ACA at the time, um, because it's a joint committee between ACA and Cricket Australia. So before he left, he, he rang me and, and said, look, you know, I've got some really good news. You've been inducted. So Again, from my point of view, I've been to these awards, um, both ICC and Cricket Australia, and you look at the people that are inducted and absolute legends of the game have played an important role. And I guess, I guess for me, I see so many other previous female players who weren't afforded the, um, the opportunity to play as much as I did, but yet probably more skillful, more talented, and did it a hell of a lot harder than I did. So... I guess I feel like a little bit of an imposter um, because I, I, I still feel that there are plenty more other people that need to be recognised. But it certainly is, is, is nice to kind of reflect on the recent couple of um, nominations and inductions um, with my family. And I guess it, it means all that hard work and missing out on friends, um, birthday parties, weddings, birthdays, you name it, have been worth it. Yeah, all that training and hard work. Uh, you, it's inter interesting you mentioned that, um, you know, you felt like an imposter. H has it kind of sunk in since then a little bit that, you know, you're in, you know, these great Hall of Fames and, you know, you've sort of been able to, I guess, digest um, everything you've been able to achieve a bit more? Uh, yes and no, I guess, because the world, we're all just trying to to grapple with the world and get things going. So, I guess it's kind of in the back of my mind and maybe because it hasn't been a big um, ceremony or the awards where you kind of sit down and they kind of do, this is your life type thing. Mm. Well, <laughs> where, we're doing that now. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> Thanks, Menace. Look, you know, when you, when you look at the list of, of people inducted into the Hall of Fame, you, you kind of go, wow, I can't believe that I'm there. So, yeah, I, I mean, I have when when it was happening and when I had to do Zoom chats and for the award ceremony, um, it was it was nice to reflect on, on, I guess, people that have been important throughout my development. And you take your time to kind of think of, the, of those people. You know, when you were a young child and when they first introduced you to cricket or made you feel accepted within the boys team or whatever it may be that everyone's played an important role in my development. I imagine it must've been a pretty special moment when you told your dad both bits of news. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, he was chuffed like God bless him. He, you know, he's um, he's always been my biggest supporter. He's always kind of always pushed me to, to really strive and be the best I could be in, in whatever I've done um, in life. So, you know, he, it was a very proud moment for him. You know, it's funny because my sister doesn't necessarily quite get it all, but, you know, she's just as proud and has always been coming to the grounds to watch me play, even when I came out of retirement with the Sydney Sixers. And my nephew, he's a funny one. He's just like, oh, so what do you get? <laughs> so, you know, it, you just have, you have three different reactions with my family, which is, um, which is gold. What do you get? So with the ICC, you get um, a frame and a hat um, that's framed and you get a little gold pin that has the hat part of ICC Hall of Fame. And then for Cricket Australia, there's, I think there's just an award that I'm still yet to, to get. So, yeah, I think right. that's it. 
your, your mantelpiece <laughs> will be filling up. Um, yes. I mean, you spend a lot of time talking about other cricketers' stories in commentary and media. Do you, are you able to sort of comprehend that, that your story is pretty special, that, um, you know, you started at an orphanage in India and now, you, you know, you've reached the, the peak of both international cricket and now broadcasting. I, I mean, yeah, do you get why people are drawn to that story? Yeah, uh, I, I guess for me, um, and it's a bit like everyone's life, they kind of go, well, it's just my life. It's just my story. It's not that interesting. Yet mine was always very different to everyone else's, firstly being adopted and um, immigrating here in, in Australia at a young age. I've been fortunate enough to, to be involved in a lot of um, speaking engagements. So obviously you kind of go through how you started, who kind of put you under their wing, how did you learn the game of cricket when it was really a male-dominated sport back in the 80s um, and 90s. So, yeah, I, I tell that story and people are amazed. But like I said, I still think, well, it's just my story. Like, it's just my life. That's just how it is. But, yeah, it, especially when I come here to India, that they're all always very... Um, very much um, about saying, well, she's one of ours, you know, she was born in India and, um, you know, she spends so much time now here in India as well, um, post-playing days as well. So, yeah, my story is fascinating. It's different. Just like everyone else's, there's, there's a few highs, there's plenty of lows along the way, but it's something that I'm completely proud about because there has been some big hurdles along the way. Well, you should be very proud. And it's been, I think, really special to just be recognised, not only in your in Australia, but to have that international recognition it just shows how much you're appreciated around the cricket community. So, yeah, that's, that's a huge, I'm just so pleased that you got inducted into both Hall of Fames. So sort of going back to the beginning, like when did you kind of fall in love with the game? What was that thing that just twigged? Yeah, I think I think like most Australian kids, just played in the in the backyard. And my father, being born and bred in India, he, you know, he used to be taken to cricket matches with his father. So everyone here in India follows cricket so much that they are the perfect pundits. Really, they 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 live and breathe every statistic and every match, and they can recall things um, extremely well. So my father had a passion for the game he kind of would play in the backyard with me. He took us um, to the SCG when I was young. Um, I remember sitting um, in the Barongal stand and you kind of look out over, over the hill back then um, and uh, see all of the shenanigans that was going on at, on the hill. And it was, it was a great, it was a great time because we had friends in Newcastle that would come down and there was a, um, a girl who's still very, you know, I'm still very close to her. So she's two years younger than me. We'd get dressed up in the same gear, you know, get bed sheets and ride Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. You know, all of that, that stuff that, you know, we, we all of us love about the 80s and 90s of cricket going and watching. And, and back then there was two or three games a summer, you know, Australia were playing, that's it. Like, <laughs> so um, it was a big occasion. Um, and I still remember hoping that um, the SCG matches or even the test match would get sold out. So it'd be shown on channel nine. So, you know, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, so cricket was certainly a passion within my family. Um, I played it. Uh, I started playing it at under tens and, but tennis was actually my sport that I wanted to excel at. And it wasn't until I was probably about 12 or 13, I, I kind of made the switch because tennis was a lonely sport. It was quite hard, obviously, because it's, you know, there's a lot of um, stepping stones to get up into the elite level. But I felt it was a very lonely and to a certain extent, bitchy sport. So the team sport of cricket drew me in and, and probably from around the age of 14 or 15, that's when I thought, Right. And that's probably when I also was aware of an Australian women's cricket team, at, you know, a, a domestic structure, underage competitions. Whereas when I first started playing under 10s, boys, I didn't even know women's cricket existed. Do you think uh, playing cricket sort of helped you find your identity in a new country? And do you think there was a, a bit of that, that it, it kind of helped just, you know, helped that process? 
I think being sporty certainly did. I mean, you look at the Australian culture and it's be outdoors, be active, cricket, tennis, sports, AFL, football, obviously wasn't involved in any of that. But certainly um, sport allowed me to blend in and I was fairly good at it. So um, all the cool kids at school were always really sporty, active, good runners, cross country, all of that type of stuff. And that that's the stuff that I wanted to be involved in. So for me, my, my childhood was one that was positive, that was inclusive, um, yet for my sister it was completely different. So um, it just shows you potentially how Australian culture was back then. You know, they were more accepting of people that fitted into their ways and anyone that was a little bit different, um, they were quite quick. School kids were quite quick to bully and tease. So um, I think sport was my saviour, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about your sister having a different experience. I mean, well, I guess you said you had a good experience. She didn't. Surely there were small issues when you were playing as a youngster where even not explicit but sexism or racism that sometimes people didn't even realise they were doing. Um, you know, how, how does that make you sort of view Australians at the time? Yeah, um, I think... I think to be honest, it was look. I, I can't think of any from a from a racism point of view. I I think there was one comment when I was like in kindergarten, and a year two stuck up for me, and that was it. I guess casual racism existed, but the Aussie banter, <laughs> political correctness was not around in That's in the eighties and nineties. So just the jokes of Lisa, you can get the bags because you're the helper, or uh, I guess there was one there was one remark and I wrote about it in the Sydney Morning Herald. It was soon after the Black Lives Matter over in England and that started to take off. But it was like my teammates kind of pinned me down and wanted to put a bindi on my forehead or a dot um, because of, from an Indian point of view. And I'm like, what? Why are you doing that? Like physically pushing me down on the bed to try and do it. That upset me. Friends used to call me Tabuli, Suzuki, Homus, and I'm like, well, I'm not even Lebanese, but any anything different, awkward, they would say. So that 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 casual racism was there, but and I probably started to to say, oh, hey, I'm the token, you know, I'm the, you know, we're ticking a box with me here in the side. So I used um, humor as a way to probably protect myself a little bit. Um, and probably get in all of the, the the silly jokes before anyone else could get in. But but that, I don't think it, apart from a couple of times, which I mentioned about being pinned down, um, it never really bothered me that much. But when you look back on, on your time, you, you're constantly doing it, you're constantly saying it. So I guess that has a, an effect at the end of the day. Um, sexism, it's probably... I probably found things a little bit harder more in the commentary world because as female broadcasters, we've come in and we've come in with a different opinion. And obviously at the moment, things that are blowing up, you know, Crick Info is changing the term batsman to batter. Oh, yes. Um, and um, they've also changed a, a while ago, not man of the match, player of the match. Yeah. Yet I still have conversations with my fellow commentators with executive producers who go, well, men are out there playing, so it's man of the match. What do you guys do in women's cricket? I go, we say player of the match. Like, how? it's not that hard. So I've actually found it more frustrating, the sexism now, because things are starting to change and there's females more heavily involved in the game. Women's cricket is more prominent, yet... People are, are very adamant that we cannot change things. We can't make it more inclusive. And, you know, even just on, on social media, I put out a tweet saying about this Crick Info change of, of, batter to, uh, batsman to batter. And I said, interesting to note that it's all males that are kicking up a stink and having a go. And it's like, it's not about you. It's never been about you. And I guess my point with the tweet was, don't you want the game to grow? Don't you want more women to be involved? And people saying, well, if it's surely if just changing batsmen to batter is going to grow the game or the women's game, then it's, it's ridiculous. And it's like you guys are, are stuck. You put your head in the sand and you just don't want to see your world. And I guess that's probably been the most frustrating thing um, from a sexist point of view because 
you feel like you're just having to have the same conversations again and it's a constant battle. It's a hot topic and I sort of look at it as it's, it's about the, the young well, the young female person that's watching the game on, say, TV or at the ground in every terms male gendered. And then you're explicitly, um, you know, excluding them from the conversation. Yeah. I think bad is a much better term. I've never seen the problem with it. So, yeah, I totally see where you're coming from. And I think it's just a lack of awareness. People just don't understand what it's like for a young girl to be watching a game where everything's male gendered then you feel it's not for you correct exactly and even you know people saying well why can't you have woman of the match and then man of the match and I said and I went back and I said what do you do about junior cricket when it's mixed teams do we forget Mm. about grassroots cricket like where everyone's blending in together like come on people like just think think logically please please that's all I ask you to do yeah, definitely. And with the, the stuff about racism, I'm just curious. I felt that Cricket Australia and the Australian cricket team dropped the ball last year when the BLM issue arose and the, the team never made a, a, an explicit statement about where they stood on it. And at the end of the summer, there was a racism furor at the SCG regarding the Indian cricket team. And I see a direct correlation because... I just don't think the Australian cricket team had enough guts to go, we're going to take our knee at the beginning of the summer to show our solidarity with the issue. Yeah, it's, it's, a, tricky, it's a tricky one. And obviously I'm, I'm involved with the ACA and the mm. Players Association. And I remember speaking to a couple of the male players um, who were saying they were going to do the barefoot circle. And I said, that's fine. But that is a separate issue to Black Lives Matter. Don't think doing the barefoot circle, you're ticking the Black Lives Matter box because you're not. I, I feel like in Australia, and again, it goes back to goes back to even um, terms of player in the match, batsman, batter. Predominantly white males do not think about what it's like to be someone else, something different. You know, even speaking to my sister, who's of darker colour than me because she's from South India, she's she's even commented sometimes she walks into a shop and she feels that she's being judged by how she looks straight away because of her colour. And we're here in the 21st century and these things are still happening. So, yeah, there, there was an element and, 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 and also I know that there were... Um, some differences within WBBL franchises and Big Bash franchises. Some teams wanted to do it, some teams didn't want to do it. Um, And there there probably would be a nice correlation for those that are from West Indian or England um, where probably Black Lives Matter is is more of an issue. It's not necessarily an issue here in Australia. It's more the Indigenous population. That's why I think um, the Australian cricket team probably felt that they were focusing on what is the issue in this country, but really it is a global issue. Um, um, the Black Lives um, Movement is a global issue, not necessarily just about Australia. So I think in in a certain extent, they didn't quite understand how big an impact um, the Black Lives Matter was and, and what they potentially could have done for it. I also think it's a very naive uh, view to just go, what's our problem here and not think about the broader issue a massive cop out. The barefoot circle was a massive cop out. No one saw it because it was done, you know, an hour before the game started. And I felt the cricket Australia, they can't make the players do something, but they did not advise their, their players well. And I think, you know, it just further plays into this image of Australia being insular and struggling to see past its own issues. I think the main thing is uh, one thing that was certainly highlighted for me was education on Indigenous issues, but also Black Lives Matter needed to happen more. And um, there was probably a scurry of, we've got to educate them, at least we can talk to elders and they can um, instruct the players on on reasons why these things are important. But like I said, in Australia, I, I don't think we had people to turn to to educate us on that. Um, issue. So you you might be right in the saying that um, 
you know, and and I guess for, for, it's interesting to hear your point of view because you're a lover of the game. You watch that much cricket. Um, you're across a lot of things, and for you to have those opinions, those strong opinions, um, hopefully, um, people within Cricket Australia are listening. Let's hope so. Now, now back to some playing stuff. Um, what was it like when you <laughs> got the bag? Stuff. What what? <laughs> I said lighter stuff. But yeah, you know, we, we'll get back to politics maybe. Um, <laughs> but tell me, what was it like when you got the the, the breakers call up uh, first off? Yeah, so I was um, had just played under 19s um, national championship and literally got home and got the call up for next weekend to play against Queensland out at Kings Park, out at Parramatta. There were a couple of players, Joe Gary and... And Farrell, and um, they they had actually been hit by a bus. Yes. Oh no, a while ago. No, no, no. You no. drive? Were you ago. driving that bus to drive? No, I wasn't the driving that bus. But they were hit by a bus, and there was a court case about getting what's the word? Getting compensation. Compensation for it, and so playing cricket, and there was a lot of injuries and and things like that. So I kind of got called in halfway through the season. So yeah, it was you know it was dreams come true. Um, and it's quite funny because you literally play at Kings Park one weekend and then the next weekend you're playing at the SCG. So kind of really distinct, different grounds. Um, but um, amazing, amazing experience to play with players that aren't recognised now, but someone like a Sally Griffith or a Kate Walsh who were, you know, so, so much state cricketers. Um, to get my opportunity to play with them was pretty special. How did you go in the first game? Do you remember? Did I get a wicket? We one there was a rain. Was there rain? One was washed out. I think okay. the second game. I don't know how. <laughs> I, just, I think as well that you're an a sort of a, almost a sort of nice bridge between two a few generations almost of cricketers. That you know when you started the breakers, they were probably not paid at all, paid to play, taking time off work. Then sort of during your career, you started to at least get expenses paid for. And then by the end of your career, players that you had played with and coached were now being paid to play. I guess what was the atmosphere like in those early dressing rooms when you've got women that are working, they might have families, you know, it was a real tough slog, I I imagine. Yeah, look, um, it wasn't a tough slog then when you think about, well, that's, that was what we did. Um, when you now compare it now, you go, I don't know how I did it. Um, but all of us were working full time. So work full time, train twice a week. Um, Tuesday, Thursdays was our training days at the SCG. And then you play weekends and then you go back to work. So there was no nice recovery. You know, you had a coach, you had your manager. I don't even know if we had a physio back then for New South Wales. Doubt you did. Yeah. I, I so, remember the New South Wales team like training on grade ground sometimes. Like, yeah. Sure, I yeah, saw, saw Mossman, uh, the New South Wales breakers had come in and train there some afternoons. Yeah, it was all about trying to find venues sometimes because obviously when the big boys came in town, we were kind of shafted. Yeah, or like the under-16 men would get a preference in the nets probably back then. Yeah, so it was about trying to to get those opportunities. I mean, but we loved it. We enjoyed it. We had fun. You kind of looked forward to seeing each other because it was – it was almost a second life. You know, you had your life, your home life, your family life, then you had your work life and then you had your sporting life. And it, and it was kind of great. I think, I think back then players were, whilst they were stretched, they were more balanced. They didn't have all their eggs in one basket. Cricket was a passion, a love, you know, and and if you could represent and and play for your state or your country, a a huge honour, but that's all it was. Um, you know, it, it wasn't your job. It wasn't, it wasn't your nine to five. You've got to perform well in order to, to get your pay rise type thing. It wasn't ever hard work. It was things that you wanted to do um, that you, all your spare time was given to cricket. So, oh yeah. I, I, you know, we have fun memories of, of, you know, you, you fly in, you'd get your, your vans and off your chuff to Frankston or, um, out to to Colac and you play on you know we, you had your your mums cooking all of your lunch and you know beautiful teas and everything like that they're the stories that you remember the most not flying business class going into five-star accommodation 
go to the ground, come back to the hotel and then fly out next. You know, we've got some great stories along the way. Yeah, adversity can bring groups together. It's right. interesting you talk about, um, you know, the perspective. And one thing that I think is really evident in the current Australian women's team is that they all have that perspective because it, most of them were, you know, started playing when it wasn't a professional game. So um, they're, they're able to sort of understand that what they do is a privilege and a great job. And, you know, they know how hard a lot of average Australians are doing and what life is like if you're not a professional athlete. So it keeps them grounded. Um, yeah. Do you think there's ever a, a time in, you know, 10 years where that's gone and female players have forgotten that? I, I hope not. I think we've got some wonderful people within the Australian women's team, like a Rachel Haynes, a Lisa Healy, who are very aware of the past players and what the struggles were. I mean, and those two players, I played a lot of cricket with them, you know, in National League, like I said, you play in a week and then you fly home and you go back to work type thing. So they've kind of come through those pathways. I hope that, you know, those players pass on, and educate the younger ones of, of what it was like, how hard it was and how lucky they are now so that they can acknowledge. Um, and not necessarily, I think the main thing is to understand that um, as female cricketers, I, I think we have a role in, in continually educating people about the women's game, can, um, being more accessible than probably the male players um, to fans, to kids, to grassroots cricket. Go play club cricket when you can. I know Elisa Healy um, does that all the time. Like don't don't put yourself, you know, on this pedestal and forget where you came from. I think that's that's the main thing. If you, if you can still find ways to give back and and do it for free, not ask, well, is this part of my contract? Is this a player appearance? And do it because you want to do it. Do it because you love it. You know, that would be my my message to the younger generation. Just don't forget where you came from and, and, and players have given up a lot along the way for you guys to be where you are. So just be kind when you're in those privileged positions. Uh, well, actually, interestingly, uh, you'd be proud of me. I commentated the New South Wales Premier Cricket Women's Grade Final. And you're right, a lot of the WB, WBBL players came back and played for Northern Districts versus Sydney Cricket Club. Northern Districts got the win in the Women's Premier Cricket Final at Bankstown Oval. But, yeah, the, the current Australian team all have great um, perspective. And even, I think, a couple of years ago, Elisa Healy came over to my house with you and recorded a podcast. Yeah. Now, would you get, I don't know, Tim Payne or one of the Aussie men male players coming over to my house to record a podcast not so sure yeah i mean look i can understand in the men's setup you get asked a lot, a lot of um, and even and and even now or the female players even myself you get asked a lot to be on podcasts and you try and give yourself time to say yes i'll, I'll help out but at, at some point you can't say yes to everything so i get that i do understand that but so I think, I think the great thing and why women's cricket has grown so much in our country is because people see the Australian women's side as your mate, your friend next door, your neighbour, your, the person you see in your, the cafe regularly, and they're just normal human beings. They're not something different. So there's something very relatable with them, um, and that I think that has struck a chord with the Australian public. So I hope they never lose that. Um, I hope that, that that aspect still keeps growing because I think that's one of um, the best qualities about our Australian women's side. Well, you'll be around to keep them in line with all your commentary. <laughs> I don't know if they'll listen to me, Menace. <laughs> <They might. laughs> I'm, I'm the old has-been, uh, you know, washed up that just comments on their games now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the multi-hall of fame inductee. Uh, <laughs> what, what about the first game for Australia? Do you remember that, putting on the... Baggy yep. Was it, a- it was, um, so I got the call up for the Ashes. My family was so excited because my mum's originally from England. So she came back at the time. She she had breast cancer and I think they separated her chemo treatments. So she got to see her mum, which was really good. And first game was in Derby. I remember um, I got two wickets. One of the wickets was Claire Taylor and it was a juicy full toss and she missed it and it was bold. So it was very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, so, you know, that, that was an interesting tour because I'd rolled my ankle before we even flew out um, to England and I think it was like a grade two. It was a pretty bad one. Um, and then you fly in economy class with Ouch. your ankle throbbing. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't as nice. But a great tour in the sense that we went to Ireland. We were billeted out in Ireland uh, when we played the games there. So went into family homes and, yeah, some great memories. But I learned then and there that I didn't want to be running drinks very much. So had to work on a lot of things in order to, to get back in the side but and stay in the playing 11. But I remember playing my first few games and I thought I had to play a different brand of cricket or I had to change what I did. And um, I think all players, when you take that next step up, you feel like you have to change what you're doing. But what you've been doing is the reason why you're there and it takes a little bit of time to figure that out. So, um, yeah, it was, um, I mean, get the first call up for an Ashes tour. Fantastic. If, if you pinch yourself. Definitely. And what was your approach to captaincy? How did you sort of look at getting the best out of players? Yeah. Look, I, I was fortunate enough to be captain by Belinda Clark, who, who I still think is the best, best captain I ever played under. She was always very calm in any situation. And there were, I mean, and back then there were times where the New South Wales team should have lost or the Australian team should have lost, but we always found ways of winning. Um, And just her composure on being able to keep things calm. Like you look to your leaders in pressure situations and if they're flapping around, (laughs) doesn't give you a lot of hope. And I've played under some of those captains, but Belinda was very calm. So I learned, I learned that skill from her. Um, I guess from my point of view, I always thought getting to know who the person was away from the field was really important because as we know, there's so many things that can go on in in a person's life and it can affect how they play. So I tried to do that. I tried to ensure that the younger players felt very comfortable coming into the New South Wales setup because you know, when I first came in, it was as a youngster, you keep your mouth shut, you know, you don't say anything, um, you sit and you learn. If you say something, you're probably going to get teased. <laughs> it was that kind of hard school. So I tried to probably change that a little bit and make them feel probably more included than maybe sometimes even the more experienced players. And did you enjoy that challenge of being the skipper? I loved it. I, I actually... Um, I actually really enjoyed it because I, I, I had always enjoyed the, the tactical side of the game. I saw or I still see cricket as a game of chess. Um, and the captains that are very good are those that can see what the opposition's doing two, three moves ahead and be able to combat that. So I, I certainly enjoyed that aspect. I enjoyed trusting my gut and sometimes it was wrong. Sometimes I got it completely wrong, but I enjoyed the lessons that you could learn being a skipper out there. I imagine you were a great skipper. I've heard you say that 2009 was a tough year for you. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because it was, it's a year that I want to erase out of my life. But anyway. Well, what would you, I'm just curious, what would you, if you know, you were talking to a current player, male or female, and they were going through a horror year, what advice would you give them? Um, what advice? Um, I think try and put things in perspective. Try and separate things. So surely there's something going well in your life. But when when you put all your eggs in one basket in 2009 was a year of that because we had a home World Cup and then we had a T20 World Cup and things didn't go very well. Everything kind of rolls into one uh, and it can become all encompassing. Um, but if you try and separate and put things in perspective, you, you'll be able to find a way out of it. But yeah, 2009 was a challenging year for me personally, but also then from a team aspect, you know, things kind of went off the rails dramatically. Um, We had our worst performance in a World Cup ever. Um, It happened to be the home World Cup as well. Um, Wasn't the World Cup final played at North Sydney Oval with a few hundred people or something? (laughs) Far short of the 90,000 we got. Yeah, to be honest, that was the first... 2009 was the first World Cup that came under the auspices of ICC. So um, it was the first time that matches were ticketed. We had, you know, f- so, so yeah, you, you can look at that and go, Whoa, 
does nothing. But when you look at 2005, when we played it in South Africa, it was still under the International Women's Cricket Council. Um, soon after that, everyone um, integrated and women's cricket fell under ICC, the national boards, and then also state associations. So, yeah, first time it was ticketed, first time more than the semifinals and the finals were televised. So we had Danny Morrison, um, Wasn Macram, Belinda Clark, Mel Jones, I think, did games then. So it was the first time I think 10, 10 games were telecast. So it was all part of the great plan to get up to that 90,000. I guess you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, it was a stepping stone. It was certainly a stepping stone. And, um, yeah, it was a great event in that aspect. Um, just it wasn't Not on the field. Tournament. Didn't Terrible the pom- tournament the, for us. Didn't the Poms win it? Yeah, the Poms w- won it because New Zealand seemed to ha- have a, a psychological barrier when it comes to England. They just can't find ways to beat them. They just have a psychological barrier to winning finals, male or female. <laughs> uh, so you retired in 2013, four World Cup wins, but you know, finishing in Mumbai, lifting the World Cup trophy, just a fairy tale finish. Isn't your father from Mumbai or your family? So, I mean, it really was a fairy tale finish, like a lot of your story, even though you're too humble to admit it. But what was it too early? It was 2013. Did you <laughs> retire a few years too early? Uh, some people may say yes. Um, for me, I would say absolutely not. It was the perfect time. I had probably probably 18 months prior to that, I wanted to step away from the game. I wasn't enjoying it. Everything just got too hard. You know, you're literally giving up all your annual leave from work um, to play and it wasn't fun. So it's like, what? why even bother do this? But I remember my father was like, no, 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 you should retire when you want, but when you're on top of your game. And I w- certainly wasn't on top of my game for for a number of reasons. Um, and then I had some teammates of mine, Shelly Nitschke and um, Sarah Andrews, who were good friends. And they said, no, 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 you've got to go. You, you can't you can't walk away from the game earlier than what you should. You, you should finish who, the way you want to finish. And um, there was a change in coaching staff. And I remember Catherine Fitzpatrick came in and she, <laughs> she rang me up. She said, I'm not going to tell you how to suck eggs you know how to play the game. I want to get the best out of you. How do we do that? Um, and it, it kind of probably changed my, the way I saw it at, the, at that point. And there was obviously younger players coming through the ranks. Meg Lanning had just kind of um, made her debut. She's okay. Um, yeah, she was okay back then. <laughs> mm. um, so um, uh, Elisa Healy was, was kind of sitting on the sidelines for ODI cricket. And we had two two World Cups. So we had um, 2012 was the T20 World Cup in Sri Lanka and then 2013 was the 50 over World Cup. And I thought, right, and I'd set my goal, right, two World Cups. We'd, we had beaten England um, in 2011 at Bankstown to regain the Ashes, so which is something that we had lost in 2005. So we had had that and I thought, right, here's a chance to win T20 World Cup, 50 over World Cup, and then out you go. And so I just told a couple of my close friends, not within, not, not, not within the Australian cricket team and my family, that Mumbai was going to be my last event. Um, some of them came over. Unfortunately, my family couldn't. But, yeah, to, and the hope was, the hope and the dream was to, to play in the final, win the World Cup, be number one in all, all formats and walk away from the game. Um, and, yeah, the fairy tale was complete. And, and to take the final catch a good little diving catch to my right, um, you know, had really topped it off. And then, what, 40 minutes later, I retired in the change rooms. Wow. I find it incredible that Cricket New South Wales made you take your annual leave to play for Australia. It, it... Well, Belinda Clark, she was she was the head of women's cricket for Cricket Australia, and she had to take annual leave to captain her country. Yeah, just... Uh, I know it was a different time, but it, it doesn't age well. It was a different well. time. It doesn't age well. So you retire. Uh, I know you missed, you know, your teammates, especially once you retired. You came back for the Sixers, lost the final, won a final, even though you weren't playing in the second final. But still, what was it like coming back after the break? Look, I, I was excited because I wanted to play with my mates. I never thought leaving the game I would miss playing with my mates. And obviously 
at that stage, Elisa Healy, Elise Perry, Sarah Ailey were, were three of my closest friends within the side. So when they were with the Sydney Sixers and the Sixers asked me to play, I said, hell yeah, I'm coming back. This this looks like a bit of fun. Then it dawned on me, I need to get fit. <laughs> the Ouch. game has changed. I wasn't necessarily worried about my skill level, but the fitness aspect. So I spent a lot of <clears throat> time, you know, losing losing a bit of weight getting running again, doing all of those type of things. Because in my mind, I had played the game at a certain level. And if I was coming back, I wanted to be able to still be able to execute my skills the way I did. So, yeah, it took a bit of time. But, yeah, it was an enjoyable first year. Losing the first six games weren't wasn't ideal. And I remember going, I didn't come out of retirement for this. <laughs> so, um yeah, so we were able to change it around, and and it was one of the great stories of WBBL. Yeah, was that is there a, a little bit of you, not sort of from a an envy point of view, but just wonders what it had been been like for you if you've been able to play in an era where you can really find out how good you can be. Yeah, I I had said I had said actually to to Tracy a couple of years ago, I said I wonder if I could have coped in this era you know, literally cricket, seven days a week, a week, fitness levels have to be at, you know, an extreme level, um, monitored everything that you do. You know, I, I, I have said I don't think I would have been able to cope. Um, but she and a few others have, have told me, and they go, you would have adapted to it. And, and I guess it would have been nice to see what I could have achieved um, if I wasn't trying to fit in a full-time job, training around that. I mean, and I was one of the fortunate ones because I was working at Cricket New South Wales. So at lunchtime I could go down and use the gym, whereas some people didn't have access to gyms, you know, at their workplace. So, um, yeah, it would have been nice to see what I could have achieved because I think physically I would have been a hell of a lot better um, and what that would have done to my performances on the field, I guess we'll never know. I think you would have excelled. Yeah, the competitive juices, they're, they're so prevalent. Look, that doesn't change. The competitive juices, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're full-time or part-time. That was at it as at its extreme levels. Mm. I guess um, last year you're at the T20 World Cup win by the Australian women's team, almost 90,000 people. You've said you sort of had tears backstage. No, I was bawling. I was bawling. 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 Let's, <laughs> what, why were you bawling? Was it just, yeah, tell me. I'm, I'm curious. Well, I, I had done the pre-show out there um, on the ground for, for obviously the coverage. And then I was thought, right, the teams are lining up for the anthems. Great time to get a good shot, you know, good for Instagram, Twitter, thinking social media. And then the anthems start to play. And I start to well up and because I have actually good friends within the Indian side and um, I know them, I know some of them really well. And, you know, I want, I was really happy for them to come in and play in the final. Then the Australian anthem starts and I just start bawling. And then I see Elisa Healy and Elise Perry looking at me laughing. And I'm going, typical idiots, you know, they're in this wonderful position. But why I was crying was uh, I think where the game had come from, I never thought, I never thought that I would see that in, in my lifetime or as quickly as, as it happened. It was always a hope and a dream. Um, I had bumped into so many past players, volunteers, club cricketers that had flown down and made the trip um, going, I want to be here for this moment. And when you, when, 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 when ICC and Cricket Australia in 2016 said they wanted to hold the World Cup final at the MCG, everyone was like, really? Like, aren't we biting a bit too much off? Like, surely let's go to a smaller ground and pack that out. But to see it happen and, and everything that had happened along the way, uh, yeah, emotions just got to me. It was a special moment, probably one of my best moments. Um, if you think of all the things that I've done on the field, I think you would say anyone that was there, that would be on, high on their list. Yeah, amazing night. You, you were a trailblazer on the field, but also a trailblazer off the field. Even in retirement, you just keep yourself so busy 
I think in my humble opinion, you're one of the most complete cricket commentators in the world. You can do everything, men's cricket, women's cricket, white ball cricket, red ball cricket, one day competitions. I mean, did you love commentating? <laughs> Uh, my first opportunity was actually uh, 2010 and I did five overs in between Mark Nicholas and Tony Gregg. It was the ACA All-Stars versus Australia. Um, that's the game where Tim Payne broke his finger. So as soon as I did five overs there, I was like, geez, this is pretty good. How do I get a gig here? So from 2010, I had always wanted to, to branch out and go into commentary. And back then there were no females involved at all, no women within any broadcast that I was aware of um, or that I had seen or heard. So I guess from, from then on I, I tried to get an understanding of it, obviously still playing. I was quite happy to be mic'd up. Um, I think one of the first games that the Australian women's side were mic'd up, I was mic'd up whilst I was bowling quite happy to have a conversation with slats and, and tubby and, and, and heels in the commentary box. And so I started to kind of um, get my relationship going with these type of people thinking whenever I retire, it'd be great to go into that. So when I retired, uh, you know, even before I retired, I think ABC grandstand gave me an opportunity to, and they were commenting um, on the big bash. So again, got a chance within radio and, and they gave me a chance even when I retired to kind of step into radio a bit more and cover men's cricket. And the thing was that, you know, I, I saw it as firstly a great way to still be involved in the game. I thought it was a very privileged position to be able to, to t talk, discuss, share um, stories, what's happening to the public. I felt also that as a female, I'd never growing up heard a female talk about the game, but yet I was still a passionate fan. Why couldn't a, fe a women's op uh, opinion, why couldn't that be expressed? Um, and then I thought it was a great way to keep educating people on women's cricket because if I'm there, I'm going to talk about the women's game. I'm going to reflect on my experiences, which is all women's cricket. And, and I thought that that was a great chance. So as soon as I got the opportunity, I was like, how do I make this a full-time gig? And I guess I'm pinching myself now that, that I get to travel around the world and, and be part of some amazing tournaments. Um, and I've met so many wonderful people, but I, I enjoy watching cricket first and foremost, like you menners, um, and I know what you're like. I'll have the shield, shield being played, you know, through my TV or if there's Zimbabwe playing Ireland, it would probably be on the back, in, in the background whilst I'm doing some other work. So I'm very comfortable and happy to watch cricket. And now that I know all of these commentators that I hear, I've gotten to know them a bit more and I enjoy listening to them and the banter and because I know them personally now as well. So, yeah, it's a great gig and, you know, I know that I'm not going to be everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> I learned that pretty quick. People have had to get used to the female voice. Um, I've had to figure out what style or what my style is. I, maybe I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, it is an art form. It is a skill. It, as you know, Menas, it's not that easy um, just to keep talking about the game and keep adding insight to whatever the pictures are. But one thing I could tell you is... I try hard in the sense that I, I, my preparation for every game is really important. I believe in, in numbers, in, in adding, adding to the pictures, telling a bit more about the person. So I, I definitely do my research and, and hopefully I've, um, I've brought a different aspect into the commentary box. Yeah. I've seen that thick book of um, stats and facts before your commentary. Uh, but I just think that, like when you were playing, you've actually, you know, carved a path for female commentators to follow. And it's not just you, it's also Alison Mitchell and Mel Jones. You know, it would have been really easy for all of you female commentators to get discouraged because, you know, if we're speaking frankly, some ex-male cricketers get a pretty easy ride into the commentary box. Um, but it hasn't been the same for, you know, you and your other female commentators. So, you know, just having that persistence and sticking at it I mean that's a quality that I just don't think should go unnoticed I think I think firstly we're all very um supportive of each other um we have a whatsapp group and it started with you know four five six 
commentators now. I think it's up to about 20 around the world. Um, females involved in the game heavily from a broadcasting point of view. So it's been great to see that we, we keep adding to that list. Well, you know, you've got people that are willing to, to, to get in the trenches with you. And, and that, that's really important, even though, to be honest, we're actually fighting for the one position against the, like all of us are going for that one female broadcast in, in most of the coverages. So um, the fact that we're all quite close in that sense and supportive is a good sign. I, I think that's, that, that's probably the most important thing. But the other thing as well is um, we've also felt that if, if we do a good job and maybe, maybe it's our naivety as well sometimes, I've always felt if I do a good job, then rewards will come my way. Um, that's not necessarily how it works in the broadcast world because it might be your look, it might be the sound of your voice, it may be how many commentators have we got from Australia or India or England. It, it's not necessarily just the best commentators get the gig. It's it's how it's all made up. So, um, yeah, you keep your head down, you do your job well and, um, and you hope you get your next gig. Well... <laughs> Not only do I hope you get your next gig, but you've you're inspiring, you know, young female broadcasters. To, like when you're playing, you can't you can't be what you can't see, and yeah, it's really clear the broadcasts are changing all around the world, and you've been a big part of it. You watch Menace, uh, you know, when all of the, these next generation of players finish, <laughs> they'll go straight into commentary. I'll be like, they already are. Anyone well, want anyone want to hire me, please, please, <laughs> anyone? Remember Lisa. <laughs> Elisa Healy's already. Remember, um, remember me, please. That's it. Well, look, we're running out of time. I just got a couple of things to wrap up. Um, so yeah. I know you've got a lot to do. Two issues that, or well, two things that you're on the board of the Australian Cricketers Association. Let's start there. You continue to give back to the game um, through that. What, what are you passionate about on the board of the Australian Cricketers Association? What's your thing? I think there's still a lot of great work that needs to be done. Um, I think the relationship between ACA and CA is probably at, at its best, at, at its peak. And I think um, for the game to move forward positively, both organisations need to work together, um, not against each other. I guess the, the thing that I'm most passionate about is I think domestic cricketers, male and female, we need to make sure that we're looking after them. I, I certainly feel... Our international teams are, are well looked after financially. There's still areas to go within the women's game anyway, but the next level down is going to be important for the longevity of, of the success of our both of our Australian teams. Um, and I'm also on the International Players Association board, FICA, um, and that's probably, that's probably being more involved in trying to ensure that women's cricket is part of the, the conversation when it comes to international players association. So New Zealand players association, South Africa, England, West Indies. And obviously Australia has probably the best model um, and, it, and we've seen how it has worked really well. So to be able to kind of pass on that learnings to the other players associations is really important. And um and then I'm fortunate enough to be part of the player representative on the ICC Women's Committee. So, you know, there's there's some interesting decisions what is that he need not to be doing. <laughs> well, when you get older, you know, you, you've got you a, more time, don't you? <laughs> well, it sounds like you've got less time. I, I imagine being on FICA is it's, must be eye opening and challenging. All these different from different areas of the world. I mean, we take for granted in Australia how you know, far the women's game is how quick it's moving. It must be sort of different going and seeing other parts where it's not moving. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, it, and it's somewhat frustrating. I mean, I'm, I'm here at the moment in India and the Indian women's side just played for the first time since the T20 World Cup mm. final. And they still, they're still kind of scratching their heads. What, what, what's coming up, even though things have been announced, dates haven't all necessarily been locked and camps and they don't have a head coach and so you kind of go come on come on guys just invest a little bit more money invest a bit more time or resources um, but that goes to you know I think from my point of view I, I want as many people having access to the game I want as many women being given the opportunity to play and I want to see the game at the end of the day being seen equally um, by the general public 
when that will happen, we're certainly on the right path, but there are, there are a lot of stepping stones in, in between that and the final goal. Oh, yes. Well, last thing I want to talk about before I let you go is the Chapel Foundation. I know it's an issue really close to your heart. Um, I'm going to the the Chapel Foundation dinner on the 12th of May. I've been to the last two. And also Greg Chapel is going to be the next guest on this podcast. You know, I, I just, one thing I notice is me about, the, that sticks out to me with the Chapel Foundation is all the money goes to the right places. It's such a lean run, all volunteers, you know, um, I think Tim Payne's the speaker at the dinner this year and a lot of money will be raised there. You know, what sort of drew you to that organisation? I guess, I guess, I've been fortunate enough to have have worked alongside or or been mentored by all of the chapels. So Trevor yeah. Chapel used to coach um, the Gordon women's side. Obviously, Greg Chapel in his role within Australian cricket, even early on, he was very into he was into probably sports psychology before it became what it is now. Um, and my father was a sports psychologist. So I remember they used to have wonderful discussions about uh, visualization, mental rehearsal, goal setting, all of that type of stuff. And then Ian Chapel, as I kind of came out of my career, I'd ring him up and I'd ask him for some tips and can he, can he spend some time listening to some of my stuff? And, but then obviously hearing Greg's story and maybe because of my background as well, being an, being part of an, an orphanage and understanding that having a, a supportive group around you, a, a loving family or, or um, friends is really important to, to young adults and the fact that there is a, a huge amount of young adults living on the, on the street or couch surfing or living in their cars in a country like Australia is, is something that probably needs to be addressed. So, um, you know, to be involved with the Chapel Foundation um, has been has been eye opening because I've learnt a lot more about youth homelessness. Um, but also, we do do some pretty cool work. Like we we don't have the answers to fix it, but we certainly help organisations who are making a big impact. And and what also drew me to the organisation is there is no overheads. There's no CEO. Even as board members, when we go to dinners, we have to pay ourselves. We don't get a free seat for our, for our time. But it's a good group of people, an eclectic group of people that I really enjoy spending time with and, and trying to make a bit of a difference. We'll head to thechapelfoundation.com to find out more about that. If there's tickets left to the dinner at the SCG May 12th. You also time it so when they do their winter sleep out, you're usually not here. So... I did it last year, actually, Menas. Thank you very much. Okay, one out of five, one out of four, or something. Um, well, <laughs> two out um, of so I've only missed one. Thank you. Okay, I'll retract that last comment. <laughs> uh, well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time on the Menas Masterclass. I really admire you. Obviously, um, you know, I met you in my cafe many years ago, and you were the the first guest ever on my podcasting journey. But you're an inspiration so thank you very much and i look forward to seeing what's next thanks man as i've enjoyed seeing your development in the podcast world going from one in the upstairs in your little studio that you set up with all the animals to, to <laughs> now what you're doing you've done a great job and yeah you certainly provide the general public a lot of great information i mean i remember coming to do some of your podcasts and all of the information you'd give me was great um, insight and information. So when I would commentate in the next day or two, so um, you've done a wonderful job and um, all the best for, for everything that you do as well. Well, thank you, Lisa. Hopefully we'll get to commentate sometime together. That would be a bit of fun, wouldn't it, Menace? Yeah. You know, it might be grey <laughs> cricket or something, but you never know. I might get the call up. I know. You do Shield. Why don't I That's speak it. to the Shield guys and ask them if I can come for a game? Well, Lisa, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the IPL and hopefully we'll catch up when you're back in Australia. Right. Thanks, Manners. Well, what a wonderful discussion with Lisa. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. For the next edition of Manners Masterclass, I will be joined by former Australian captain, Greg Chappell. 